So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. not crackling and popping, popping so far. It's amazing what a little tape will do. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that we can come into this house and worship you, that this is not the church, that we're the church, Father, that we're your hands and feet in this world, to bring glory and honor to you, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, because he gave up everything to save us. Lord, may we not be held down by the things of this world, but may we be the kind of children that are called children of the Most High, children of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we thank you and praise you. Open up our eyes and ears to hear your word and to be your obedient children, to have the love of Christ in our heart for you and for others. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this Considering Good Leaders because we're going to look at two verses in Hebrews, the next two verses in Hebrews 3, and I'm also going to talk about some of the things that you should have read in 2 Corinthians. And in the scripture that Mark read, it said that, that was Paul's words to the church in Ephesus, that God has appointed leaders in the church, that he has appointed them to lead you, to shepherd you, to guide you, not to be the ones that do the work, but the ones that help show you the way and help lead by example. In 2 Corinthians chapters 1 through 5, you read more things that a church shouldn't do. And unfortunately, we don't know how this church ever turned out, but there's been at least, this is the second letter of Corinthians, but it's at least the third letter Paul wrote, probably the fourth letter if you read some of the clues in there, and it could be even more than that. And he's visited them at least two to three times. And the reason that he's done that is to correct their ways. It's amazing how many times that we need to hear the things over and over and over again to get them through our heads. But that's the way we are as human beings. The flesh is weak. I mean, that's the way it is. We can be so easily distracted, so easily entangled, and that's why the author of Hebrews wrote the letter. And Paul writes his letter so that, that he can correct the ways of this church who are more enticed with the ways of the world than they are the ways of Jesus. And remember in Acts, as you read through, you, you remember what the example of the first church is like. They gave up everything. And when persecution came along, which makes so many turn away, they thrived as a result. They followed the way of Jesus. They were even known for being part of the way. But this church in Corinth is not growing. It's not maturing. It's not living the way that Jesus lived. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you start out reading, and you read that God comforts us. The reason that He comforts us is so that we can comfort others. Have you ever been comforted by God? If you know God, you've been comforted by God. You've made it through something in your life that you didn't think you could make it through because God is there with you to comfort you, to, to guide you, to lead you, to give you peace, to know that you are loved, to know that you have a hope. And the reason that He's there and He's the source of all comfort, of all love and everything is so that you can comfort others. Now, when you haven't had that many bad things go in your life, and most of us haven't in comparison to some Christians in the world and in the, in the scheme of Christianity in, in ancient times, then praise God that you haven't been, that you haven't had to go through as much but you still can comfort others. In fact, you have a, an advantage to comfort others even more because you're not being persecuted as much yourself. You have an, op, a, an availability to give more because more has been given to you. You have freedom of time, talent, energy, money. You're not being persecuted. So are you living to that advantage in this world or are you living for the world? 
This is exactly what's going on in the Corinthian church. And then false doctrines come in and they say, well, we don't have to do this or we can do this or we can add this to our faith and everything else. And you have another gospel, a watered down gospel, something that is not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave up heaven, lived this world and died for us. And he said, if a man will follow after him, that he'll forsake everything else, follow after him, and Jesus would make him a fisher of men. And our examples in the 12 apostles and in Paul and in Stephen and in Philip, they gave up this world. They did live a holy set-apart life. And what mattered to them was God's love for them. And because of his love, they loved him and they loved others, which Jesus summed up in his commandments. So as you think about comforting, I want you to think back to what we read in uh, the beginning of Hebrews 13 about the church should be continuing in brotherly love, not just having brotherly love, but continuing in it and growing stronger in it. They should not forget hospitality, entertaining others, feeding them, taking care of them, taking into, even strangers into their home so that those people would feel love, be cared for, and so forth. Not to forget the people in prison, the people that are persecuted, even if they're not in prison, that they're, they're suffering for whatever reason it is in this world, to remember them and do what you can for them. And so I'll throw in a thing right now for Beth. That's why she is in Romania. She fell in love with the people group there because they are suffering. They are the least of these. And she has stayed there much longer than she ever thought she would stay there. We are her source of income. And again, I put back there in the little folder one, three pamphlets about what she does in Romania, what Networks does there. So we support her, but we don't support her mission as far as the church. So think about that when you have money that you can give. Think about that when you're praying and so forth. We support Beth, but we don't as a church support her people group. You can give to that just the same. Be pure in your relationships, in your marriage, in your relationship with others. Be pure especially to God. And here we go, kind of like the Ten Commandments, we go back down to the point of don't be a lover of money. Don't let things keep you from doing other things. I mean, for a real life example, again, I'll say it, don't let that boat keep you from giving to people in Romania who don't even have food to eat. Because Christ's love compels you you are the church. You are the hands and feet. You, pr you provide ministry or you serve others. And by your love and by your serving, that will be how the world knows that you belong to Jesus Christ in His way. That you are, in fact, true believers. That you are, in fact, Christians. So if you consider 1 Corinthians and the different things that are written there, and I want to remind you of one thing. This church was part of the world. They never set themselves apart but I'm also going to throw this in there, and I'll put it, this is my opinion, so you don't throw rocks at me or anything. They weren't willing to change. Because Paul has to keep going back to them time and time again. He has to tell them, I'm your spiritual father and everything else. Don't believe these other things. Look at the example that I live. And he even says, you think that we're, that we're fools for the way that we live. You think because, that because we're being persecuted that something's wrong with us. These other people have said that if you're persecuted, you're not in God's will. Kind of like that prosperity gospel thing and, and so forth. And he has to continue to convince them that the way is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and love others, and it will be shown in the way that you live. And if you hold on to the things of this world and you're worried about yourself and the gifts that God has even given you, He doesn't deny that He's given them spiritual gifts, you use to build up yourselves, something's wrong with that church. That is not how Jesus lived. That is not what He taught. They want to follow a different gospel rather than the true gospel. That's my opinion. And I'll go back and remind you of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. They're sitting fat and happy in this world in the gospel that they proclaim, but it's not the true gospel. And they think that because they're free in Christ... They are fine, but they're not serving. They're not serving others, which is the proof of our love. 
How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me, there's where I get this from, that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as human beings. But yet they are the ones following the true way. I want you to think about and consider Paul and Timothy and Silas and Barnabas and Stephen and Peter and James and John and how they lived up their life, their life and how they did give up everything to follow Jesus. <clears throat> I want you to think about the church in Acts and how it gave up everything and how they sold their possessions so that no one had need. And when threats and suffering and persecution came along, they counted it as joy. Jesus even warned that there'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth to many who profess that they believe, who even do mighty miracles in His name. So you better wake up and think about your faith and think about your faith in action. I can think of James's letter. I can think of Hebrews' letter. I can think of Jesus' letters to the seven churches in Revelation. So let's jump to 2 Corinthians and see how 2 Corinthians starts out. Verse 3 of chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, love, unconditional, unmerited love. We've talked about that in 1 Corinthians 13, that better way, the most excellent way, where love keeps no records of wrongs, where love gives even though it's not given in return. Love gives because God first loves us. <clears throat> Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. I don't know what your text says. This is NIVs, but the word all is there in the original text. Every trouble you have. So that, so that we can what? We can comfort those in any trouble they have. And that word is there in the original text again. All and any. Every trouble you have, God comforts you so that you can comfort someone else in any and every trouble that they may have. So I've got to sit and con contemplate, am I doing that? Am I comforting others because of the comfort that I've received in Christ? Am I loving others because of the love that I've received in Christ? Am I giving to others because of what God has given to me? Am I living like Jesus Christ or am I still living like the world? <clears throat> Verse 5, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. So I have to sit there and think, how am I suffering? Why am I not suffering as much as some people? I don't have all those answers. But what I do know is I have the freedom to worship Christ and not be hindered by the things of this world. How terrible it would be to know that because I had all these freedoms, that I didn't love the Lord as much as somebody who didn't have these freedoms. And if you can't see that, then examine Christianity in some other countries today. And look at how they profess Jesus Christ, no matter what the circumstances that they're in, whether their, their children are martyred before their eyes, they continue to profess Jesus Christ. Whether they're driven from their homes and everything else, they profess Jesus Christ, because He means everything to them. So does He mean everything to me? Am I loving the Lord my God with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength? And am I loving others as I love myself? As a new commandment, Jesus said, as lo loving as He loved us. Am I doing that? God, help me to do that. Help me to not be more of a lover of myself, but help me to love you and help me to love others and help me to put it into action. Help me not to fear men, but fear you only. And know that you love me and perfect love casts out all fears. Paul and others, the true apostles, died for their faith, their witness. Their, they were martyred, the same thing as witness. They, they received martyrdom in this world. That was their wages for their faith. <laughs> they received death. They received suffering, stoning, being run out of their home, imprisoned. And praise be to God that we don't face that. So how much more of an opportunity does that give me to live? But I have to make that choice. Am I going to live for myself or am I going to live for God and others? 
The next two verses in Hebrews 13, and that's all I'm going to cover in Hebrews 13 today, is verses 7 and 8. It says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of their li- the way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I've contemplated on these two verses last week. I've contemplated this week. I've contemplated about them when I read Hebrews back then. And boy, it makes me do a lot of self-examination. Because I was called by God, and Mark read that. It's a calling of God to lead this church to be a shepherd. Either he did or he didn't. And either I am being faithful and leading the way that I should, or I am not. And that's why I try to preach the truth. But do I live the truth as much as I should? Or do I get distracted so many times? And I do. I'm going to confess it to you right now. Because of work, because of grandchildren, things that are, that are fine, because of, of uh, wanting to vacation, wanting to go see my parents, things that are legitimate. But where do we draw that line in how much we serve and how much we do serve ourselves? Now, I'm not con- condemning here, and that's why I use myself. I want to give more and more time to God because those things matter the most. So I'll take my grandkids, for example. You know, a couple years ago, we kind of got them stripped from us. And I didn't even know uh, Isabella and Ezekiel for nearly a year. With Kira, you know, we were the first ones to watch her walk, talk, chew, everything, you know. And we didn't want to do that. And I still send videos where I take her training wheels off her bicycle for the first time and stuff like that. But anyway, all these blessings that we have. But before... I would have given God the excuse if he said, hey, I'm calling you to Romania. He's not. Okay, just so you know. (laughs) Yet. (laughs) I'm calling you to Romania. You know I can't go, God, because I have all these grandkids that you have blessed me with. They are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. And I would have said I couldn't. Now I say, Lord, if that's what you're calling me to do, then please take care of my grandkids because I could have never taken care of them in the first place. And I'll rely on you more and pray more for where I can't do the things that never could save them in the first place. And I'll thank you for each and every day that I have them in my life. And even though it's hard and tired, I will take them and bathe them and heal their wounds and love them and teach them about Jesus Christ. Kara had me bring a little video in here today because we started looking at it. And it's something that I'm going to do some more, but it's what's in the Bible. And it's got little Muppet uh, characters in it. It's from the guy who did VeggieTales. And, um, yeah, VeggieTales, that's the Bob the Tomato. Yeah. And you can either like that or don't like that, but the curriculum in there is fun. And then I can be their teacher alongside of it, or Rona can be their teacher alongside of it or whatever it is. And I told you or asked you a couple weeks ago to think about the ministries that this church has. Basically, we have two. You can tell me if we have more than that. We have Beth in Romania, which how much do you give to that ministry? How much do you serve it? How much are you a servant of it? That's what the word means. And we have our children's ministry. And the reason I count down to those two, um, and children's ministry is Awanas, Sunday school, when we get to vacation Bible school so much, is because we used to do hair care. That was a ministry, but we haven't. Why haven't we started it back up? Not condemning, but have we tried to push it? What other, uh, other ministries we have? We used to go into the uh, Restorium. I don't see that being picked up by the Ministerial Association. And I'm being taped because there really is no Ministerial Association. There's me. And I don't say that proud, but the, I am the only contact. And every time that I think about quitting that ministry because it comes up quite often because I feel like I'm the only one. God sends in funds from somebody else. It's never from a church that fills up that. And I'm like, I'm sorry for doubting you, God. You filled it up again, and you've been giving me the privilege to be the servant of giving these funds out to people in need. I don't do it for glory or honor. Like I said many times, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to be on the phone call for it. I'm tired, but he continues to fill that cup. How much are you serving in those ministries? 
we started putting a playground out here and we're working on this and everything. Will you serve in a ministry if we open that up to the neighborhood kids or if it grows bigger than that? Will you serve as part of it? Will you continue to serve in Awana or whatever the program is? I'm beefing you up for VBS too there, Kim. Will you serve? I praise God that I have the chance again to train up these children. We have all four of them this weekend, and that's why Sherry's in there instead of, or wherever she's at, I guess they're downstairs now, instead of in here. I thank God that I have a chance to teach them. And it's, I can't tell you the joy that it puts in my heart to see Kira say, grab that video so you can tell them about it in church. She's excited about it. We got her a tablet this week and made sure that we put parental constraints on it because she just grabs phones from whoever and looks at anything and everything she wants and the stuff she was looking at is atrocious for a child to look at. And if you don't believe that most children look at things that they shouldn't, they look at them every single day. And we are the ones that will tell them about Jesus Christ if you're willing to take the time and effort and things to do that. And you know what's so funny? She pitched a fit about that tablet because she couldn't go on these other things. And I explained to her why I didn't want her on those things. And now she brings me the tablet and shows me. She says, look at this. And it's a, something clean. It's not necessarily about God or anything else, but it's something that's not talking about the spiritual forces of darkness in this world. It takes some time and some effort. It takes training up a child in the ways of the Lord so that they will not depart from it. How much will you serve in ministry? So when I read these things, I thought about that, like I said, examine myself, and I want to be that leader. I want to be that one that hears, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I am even more accountable, but you're accountable to God as a servant also, whether you carry the badge of pastor or not. You are a part of the body of Christ. And I don't push membership here, but I consider every one of you a member. You're an arm, you're a leg, you're a pancreas, whatever it is. Sorry for the one that's your pancreas, but you're very important. You have a job to do, and the body doesn't function properly unless you're doing your part. And God has assigned those parts. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God and you consider the outcome of their way and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The church is commanded to remember. That means to be mindful, to keep in mind, to continue to think about and make mention of it. The ones who lead them, who not only tell them the truth, make sure that this truth is there, that it's not a false gospel, but then lead by example. Remember them. And that word leader could be translated as your authority or even your ruler. Now, I'm not saying that in any way to be haughty or anything, but it's the one who has authority over you because God placed them there to be your spiritual representative. True leaders preach the truth and lead by example. I read an article, and I was going to get Sherry to read this, so I didn't read it, but she's where she's at. This is called from journeyonline.org. It's not hard to find people who can go on and on about their favorite author and tell you about their books that they've written. They will gloat about spending the entire weekend reading the author's newest novel, perhaps even staying up to 2 a.m. just to finish reading it. And wow, they would say, was it ever a good book. You just got to read it. Others will drive hundreds of miles to hear their favorite speaker, and they'll do this year after year. Now, I added this part in. What about the latest TV show, series, or show? But more often than not, if I ask these people when was the last time they sat down and read through an entire book of the Bible, other than 3 John, one chapter if you don't know it, they can't remember. Once I gave an assignment to my Sunday school to sit down and read the entire book of Hebrews <laughs> in one sitting, I told them it would take about 45 minutes to an hour, which is, I add this in there again, the length of a normal TV show. And he says that maybe 10% rose to the challenge. The article goes on to say, My fear is too many Christians are living at a level that is far below their confession. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior is the qualifying cry to be accepted in most churches today. But when you look closely at their lives, they don't really resemble Christ. 
They say follow him, but it, might, but it must be at quite a distance because there is such little resemblance between his lifestyle and theirs. How is your lifestyle? How is your church that you're a part of? I asked you last week to think about ministries. I challenge you to put suggestions. I challenge you to come up to me. I challenge you to bring it up in announcements. Whatever you feel your heart led that this part, church should be a part of in ministry. And I guarantee you if the Spirit is leading you in that, He's leading someone else in that direction too so that we can serve. If you ever want me to preach on tithing, I will tell you that tithing was an Old Testament principle that Jesus said to offer up everything as He did. To present your bodies, as Paul says, as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Whenever I'm asked, how much do I have to give? I said, how much can you not afford to give? Everything. How would you love to hear that day? You won't love to hear it. I'm being sarcastic. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Maybe you hear that, but, but you hear, you know, you only used 50% of what I gave you. You were only a good steward with that. Or 25% or 10%. Is your answer going to be, I thought I only needed to give 10? Jesus gave everything for you, and if you love him with all of your heart, then you'll give back accordingly to that love that's inside of you. The things of this world will go strangely dim. You'll have no problem deciding over the boat or deciding over people in Romania or whatever it is that God's calling you to be. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. I'm going to read a little further than Mark did. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. He did this to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Built up till when? Until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Jesus' knowledge... And we're mature in how we behave, knowing that these things were all created so God gave them to us to enjoy so that we could give to others as well. Attaining to the full measure and the fullness of Christ, the end result is to be like Christ. But if we keep reading, it says, Then we will no longer be infants. That's where most of these churches are where the letters are written to them. They're still infants. Tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of pe people in their deceitful scheming. Sounds a lot like the church in Corinth. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ, being like Jesus in this world, being His church. Verse 16, From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting lig ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Pancreas, arm, heart, leg, whatever your part is. 2 Corinthians chapters 2 through 4, Paul tells the church to forgive and gives proofs of his life of faith so they'll believe the gospel that he preaches and see that what is happening to him, the suffering that he has, is just like Jesus said, don't be surprised. And he counts it glory to suffer for Jesus. He even says that his present sufferings are nothing compared to his future glory. But will this church listen to these words? Will they follow his example? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed, by, revealed in our body, in our physical bodies. Paul is talking about him and the other leaders that are true leaders. Verse 11, For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be also revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So the more that you give up to minister and serve someone else, the more that you're presenting the love of Jesus and the life of Jesus to them. So then death is at work in all of us, but the life is at work in you. Verse 13, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since, I, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. 
All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people, the more that you serve, the more that it costs you, the more that you give, the more that you love, the more that you pray, the more that you have the knowledge in the heart of Jesus Christ, the more that you're His hands and feet, the more and more people that will, it will be reached. May cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So I think back and I say, Lord, how in the world could I just want to say, I give up because no one else wants to be a part of this process of giving back to the community through a group of churches. Why is it that this is the only church and one other that even give this entire year? Why can't we come together as the body of Christ? Why can't this community not have one hungry person in it because of the churches in this community? There's, you know, there's almost 30 of them that profess Jesus Christ. But yet there's only one person to call for the group of churches. And that one person many times says, I'm done. But God says, no, you're not. And I listen to his voice and say, okay, I get it. For our light and momentary troubles, yeah, that's what it is, <laughs> I'm not suffering, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I fix my eyes on Jesus, and that's what the church is commanded to do. And then I think back to this letter, and that's why I spent so much time on it, and I love the letter of Hebrews in the first place. But I think about all that Christ has done because it sums up all that Old Testament for me and tells me about everything that Christ has done and how wonderful He is and, and how wretched and, and sinner that I am and that I can never obtain God's mercy and grace except through Jesus Christ. I can never live a life that brings Him glory and honor except through Jesus Christ. I've been given the authority and the, and the power to live and the Old Testament saints and the church today are what makes it perfect and complete in God's plan of bringing reconciliation to mankind. Sounds like I'm getting to the next chapter of Corinthians, doesn't it? That God is reconcili reconciling mankind to himself. Paul and Timothy were true leaders. And the reason that I mentioned Timothy is because we're reading about Paul's letter to Corinth. We know that Timothy followed around with him on the journeys. We know that Timothy was sent to some of the churches. We know that Timothy became a pastor in the church of Ephesus. And Hebrews mentions Timothy in a few more verses here. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. The next part of that is consider the outcome of their way of life. Wait a minute. The church in Corinth doesn't want to consider Paul and the others, the ones that are being martyred, because we don't want that to happen to us. We fear what can happen to us more than we fear God. We love being satisfied and safe more than we want to be put at harm's way. Complacency is a terrible thing. It's hard when things are comfortable to step out and say, give me things that are uncomfortable if that's what you're calling me to do. So what does their way of life look like? What did their faith look like? I challenge you to go back and look, read Acts further along. We haven't got there yet. And look at what happened to Paul along his journeys. He was stoned. He was in prison. He was left for dead. He needed someone to encourage him, Barnabas, and he encouraged Timothy. And when we get to Timothy, which will be later on, Paul was in prison thinking he's going to die, and he's writing to Timothy. He's not writing to a church. Then he's writing to one person who's been really faithful and who knows he'll struggle because when Paul knows that he's gone, that Timothy will have doubts and stuff and he won't be there anymore, so he has to put it in God's hands to take care of Timothy and lead him to the finish where he hears, well done, my good and faithful servant. Remember those in the past. Remember those in the present. Remember how those good leaders lived a life free of this world. You might call them Jesus freaks. They might look totally different. I can remember back to growing up in church and remembering the person that was like that, that was obviously different from the world, and I can remember the impact that they had on my life. 
because they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. There were only a few of those that I can label that way. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of faith and imitate their faith. And when all else fails, because we will fail, one day I might say I walk away from the ministerial association or I walk away from this or that or whatever it is. It can happen. Or I'm gone or whatever. Or, you know, whatever it may be. Then, don't forget, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What Jesus taught, how he lived, the promises that he gives to you, the hope that he gives to you, don't forget your commission, your mission. That you're the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That no one else will go with you. Jesus will never, ever leave you. He will never, ever forsake you. Remember the words of truth. This is how a church is supposed to live. How a church is supposed to be represented in this world as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. I can tell you again from many encounters, that's not the way that a lot of people think about the church. And if you look back, Jesus said, Woe to you hypocrites who say one thing, profess one thing, but, but don't do the other. That clean the outside, but don't clean the inside. We are supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to practice brotherly love, hospitality, remembering those in prison and persecuted being pure in our relationships with one another and with God, and not being a lover of money. And then those next verses said, Don't forget the Lord is always with you. He'll never forsake you. He loves you. He is your provider and your helper to live the way that Jesus lived so that others see that you look like Christ because you not only profess it, but you live it. Jesus said these words in Matthew 6, 9 to 13, and think about them. What is that? You ought to know right off, and I'm going to do the King James Version because that's what I learned it in. This is our prayer for every believer before he ever mentioned anything about, the, about a church. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you mean that? Give us this day our daily bread, so we'll be content and satisfied. If he's given you that much more, are you sharing it? Are you giving it? And forgive us our debts as we forgive us our debtors. Is there someone that you need to forgive? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That means we agree with this. This is how we pray. But so many times our prayers are, Oh, Lord, take this burden from me, just as Paul did. And he found out that the more he prayed, the more that he understood that God's grace was sufficient. So I'm going to give you five Ps. You can write these down if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. They're to help you remember about Jesus. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I fail you or any other leader fails you, or the church fails you, or any other Christian fails you, remember that Jesus never will. The five P's are the person of Jesus, the profession that he made, the prayers that he prayed, the power that he lived by, and the promise that he gave you. The person of Jesus, how did he live? There's even, you know, that slogan, what would Jesus do? You've got it. Read the Bible. The Word made flesh and dwelt among us. How did he live? He thought of others. He was holy to God. He gave up his life to save others. Think about his profession, what he taught, so that you're not driven and tossed around by these other gospels. He said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. So many other things that Jesus taught. Are you listening to those? Or are you hearing false doctrine that are keeping you from living the way that you should? How terrible a thing to be tossed and way and live a life that didn't bring as much glory and honor as you could, knowing your calling and knowing the power that lives inside of you. Prayer. He was in constant prayer and communication with God the Father. Constantly. Praying for his mission, but so much praying for others. Power. 
In power, Jesus performed his miracles, his mighty ministry, even rose from the dead because the Holy Spirit empowered him. And Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit, the advocate, will come and you will do greater things as this body, as this church, than what I've done because there's all of you working together like Christ, if in fact that's what you're doing in unity, in harmony, living and loving as Christ loved and gave himself. And then the promise. God will never leave you. Jesus will never leave you. The Holy Spirit is with you. You are sealed as his very own, and Jesus will return. Five Ps to remember when everything else fails you that you know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that that can help you with your mission. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we wait for that promise, we realize that we are ambassadors. Ambassadors, representatives of the king. We're living in this foreign land because our home is in the kingdom of heaven. So we've got to live as a proper representative for heaven until that day comes. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We're living as kingdom children now on earth like we would live in heaven. We can't be jealous of one another. We can't be angry with one another. We can't be lovers of money. We've got to remember each people group and love them and support them. That's what we're going to do in heaven, correct? So are we doing it here on earth? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Now the one who has fashioned for us for this very purpose is God who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing to what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are home, at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. Hebrews, the whole book, faith. We are, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So what do we do? We make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Boy, that makes me not want to fear what men have to say about me or anything else, but do what God calls me to do. Verse 11, Since then we know what, what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we, what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you, cannot, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen <clears throat> rather than in what is, what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, more proof that they said themselves, <laughs> Paul's out of his mind living this way. We can be a Christian and not live this way. Okay. If we are out of our mind, as some say, if it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. It's because we love you and want to bring the truth to you, to save you, to train you up. Verse 14, for Christ's love is what compels us. But for we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. Why? That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. How about I repeat that one? Those who live, that have eternal life, that have been sealed, that have been given new birth, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again, that hope that I have, because I'm living for my home in heaven, not for my home here on earth. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in that way, we no longer do so. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The word is dekania. I butchered it probably, but that's okay. We get our word, we get that word from a word that Jesus uses, which is deaconus. Sounds kind of like a deacon in the church, doesn't it? It means literally one who waits on tables, a server. Because Jesus tells us that we will serve 
him and others if we in truly, in fact, believe. He doesn't use the word for ministry. He uses the word for servant. Because any servant is supposed to have a ministry. They're supposed to serve. A person that's a servant does what? Serves. A doctor heals. A teacher teaches. If you are his servant, you serve. So what is your ministry? How are you serving? The word is the same. <clears throat> he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Wow. And he has committed to us, he has given us this, committed to us as a good steward, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, summing this up, what? Christ's ambassadors, Jesus' representatives in this foreign land called earth until we reach heaven. <clears throat> we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you then on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I told you that Jesus didn't use the word ministry, but he used the word minister. He used it three different ways in the Gospels. You'll find it in Mark and John, but I'm going to tell you in Matthew because each one is there. In Matthew 20, 26 is the first time you'll find it in the New Testament. It says, Not so with you, talking to the disciples, that you're going to live different than the world. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Jesus said this after he predicted his death the third time. They did not understand it. But the ultimate thing of his passion was that he was going to die for them, that he loved his life so little compared to those that he'd give up his life to save them. And then they didn't understand it, and their mother didn't understand it either. So James and John's mother comes and says, let my son sit at the right and left of you when you get into your kingdom. And this is Jesus' words. Not so with you. you know, I don't, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. Anything else is for you to serve. The next time we find that Jesus uses the words, two chapters later in Matthew twenty two thirteen. 13. Then the king told the attendants, that's what the NIV means, but it's servants. Again, it's the same word. Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a guy who thought he was a servant, but definitely was not. Jesus told this after he told the parable of the wedding banquet. And the guy that thought he was going to be in the wedding banquet wasn't properly clothed. Jesus uses the word one more time in the Gospel of Matthew. And then, like I said, you'll find these same stories where he uses it in Mark and John. Matthew 23, 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. And Jesus used this again in a warning after saying the religious leaders that you think are leading you, they're not. They're hypocrites. Wow. You will serve if you're following me. There will be those who think they're going to be. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then I'm warning you because of your hypocrisy. Hey, baby. I see that. Sit down and I'm going to finish because I am there. <laughs> yes, I see. Did you learn anything in Sunday school? Did you learn anything in Sunday school? Kira, who did you learn about in Sunday school? Yeah. Like everything. From Jesus. What's the Bible teach you about? Jesus? Okay, that's all I'm asking. So I'll, I am wrapping up, not just because they're here. I asked you these questions before. I want you to think about them again. What are you doing to show and prove? 
that you are who you say you are? What about your church? Do you know the spiritual gifts that God has given you? Are you using them to build? Go ahead. You can run back there and be with them. Go. What ways is God calling us to ministry? What sins or things are entangling me from serving? What ministry specifically do you want this church and myself to be a part of? Now, I mentioned two that we have, and I said I would go back to it again. Beth, and there's Romania with that, and there's children ministry. And right here they are, perfect timing. I would give up everything in this world to teach them about Jesus Christ. Everything. And like I said, a couple years ago, I would have said... I can't give up them to serve you. And he's given me clarity by taking them away that you need to teach them to serve me. There's nothing more important. And we've got a facility. We've got a facility with a back wall now that looks pretty good and we can cook out and stuff there. And a facility that's coming along here and I know that it takes a commitment. I know that it takes effort. And I'm going to challenge you specifically to this. We do Awanas from October to May. One reason we don't do it in the summertime is because we want time to do things for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's enough of us here to do a ministry through the summer also. Where we could do something, say, for example, on a Friday night where we have a cookout and play them a little thing about Jesus and play out on the playground with our children. We've got the facility. We've got the body of Christ. Are you willing to serve? And no, I, don't, I wasn't here every Wednesday of Awana, but I was here most. And when I wasn't, there were people that served and we were able to make Awana work. And we can make whatever ministry work together. Are you willing to do that? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for what Jesus Christ has done for us. We thank you for the leaders that have that have not only taught us the truth, but have given us the examples to live by. Lord, help me to be the leader that you've called me to be. Help this to, church to be the church that you've called it to be. And Lord, help us to serve. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the service that Jesus Christ gave to us when he gave up his life to save us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.